الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره نعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. باب بر الأم. This chapter, inshallah, which is the second chapter, is being dutiful to one's mother. حدثنا أبو عاصم عن بهز بن حكيم عن أبيه عن جده. He said قلت يا رسول الله this companion he asked the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم من أبر. He says he said to the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم oh messenger of Allah towards whom shall I be dutiful? من أبر. قال أمك the messenger said to him your mother. Then he said to him من أبر. Who should I be to dutiful towards or messenger of Allah? The Prophet replied again, O Muk, your mother. And then he asked again, he said, O messenger of Allah, who should I be dutiful towards? The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa on the third attempt, he said, on the fourth attempt, sorry, he said, Abaka, your father. Thumma after that, Al-Aqraba, Fal-Aqraba. And after that, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, the next nearest relative and then the next nearest relative. Relative. In this hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam emphasizes and he points out the status and the position of the mother. When this man asked the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Who should I be most dutiful towards?" the Messenger said to him, "Your mother." So the right after any human being, after our Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Allah, a mother takes the first rights. There is no person that walks on this face of earth, the face of this earth today who has more rights over you than your mother today that is alive. No one from any human being <coughs> except your mother. The mother has a makan and a position and a status in different fields. And the reason is because she went through a lot of stages for you. Your mother, she went through a lot. Six months you were in her stomach. She was carrying you in her stomach. All this time she was struggling. She was striving. You stopped her from everything. From the things that she liked, she couldn't do it because of you. Then came the time when she had to give birth. And she struggled giving birth to her, you. She, got, she lost the beauty that she used to have. She also lost the attraction and the way she looked. Her body started to change. All this is due to you. While she was, you were in the stomach, she was worried. Is he going to come out healthy? Is he going to be alright? Once he was born, the first thing she, do, she did was she wanted to see how healthy you are. How you are. Then your mother raised you after you were born into all the stages you went through. If a child is born and he's taken by the foot and he's thrown into a bin, he won't, be, he, he won't even be able to, to help himself. That is the weakness that we went through. And now that we are strong and we think we're tough and we know it is not right that you speak back to your parents, regardless of who they are and what they are. One of the best things that I learned from my mother, Hafidah Allah Azza wa may Allah protect her, is whenever as a child I used to sometimes get, get annoyed with something she tells me to do, or I wasn't bothered to do it, or I wouldn't listen straight away, she would say to me, stand up. And when I stood up, it was like, she would say to me, look how far you are from the ground. I was the one who raised you. However far you are from the ground, I had put you through the striving and struggle. I did that for you. All those years I was doing the best for you, now I'm not going to do the best for you. So the person has to realize the rights of this woman, the individual, your mother. Your love 
is what they love. You hate what they hate. You befriend what they befriend. This is, as an individual, this is how you have to be. And then after that, after your mother, your father comes in second martaba, second position. He has his rights. He has his, and you have to understand as a child, the rights of your parents, they differ. The mother sometimes doesn't just want finance. Sometimes she doesn't just want um, you listening to her. But sometimes she needs your time. She just wants you to sit with her. Give her an hour and tell her stories and remind her of the days when you were, with her, when you were with her. Sometimes when I talk to my mom about when we were young, what she did, and I crack jokes about those things, the joy I see in her, I don't see in her when I give her as much money as she needs. It, take, it makes her leave the world that she's in. She goes back to memories. She enjoys herself. So the person has to realize the rights of this person. Ikhwan is not easy. Then when the child gives the rights to his mother, and everything in our religious brothers remember, is prioritizing. How are you going to be kind to me when you're not even kind to your mother? How are you going to be obedient to your friends when you're not to your mother? The first person whose rights that you fulfill is your mother. When you, you come with it, whatever is left over comes to your father. Then whatever is left over is to what? It's to the tr closest relative member of yours. Priority. Not to mix up everything. Your mother calls you and asks you to do something. She takes the first, she gets the first choice. It's not mom, my timetable is full. Or mom, I have to take this person from this place. Or mom, I have to do this. Abadan. This is, it goes against the speech of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why did the mother get three times and the father got one? Because the mother took, went through three stages. The stage of carrying you, the stage of giving birth to you, and the stage of raising, right, raising you. Those three stages, and that's why she got given those three anwa'ul bir, those three types of obedience. The first one is ummuk, your mother, while she was carrying you. Then after that ummuk, when she gave birth to you, it is, she's on the brink of death. Any one of you who is married and has a wife would know this situation, would understand what it is like when the woman is giving birth. She's on the edge of death. The third thing, brothers, is after that comes the hardest part for her, which is that she has to spend the years to come raising you and feeding you and dressing you and to the extent she pushes away her own wants, her own needs. I want to give an example, brothers. In the people's world, when you are a child and you do your thesis, your number two, the people around you don't like the smell that comes out of you, but your mother finds joy in it. It's the only person who's, who will grab you and crack, carry, uh, pick you up and smell what's come out and she finds it normal. It's the only person. If you don't have your number two for two days, she gets worried. Concerned, what's happened to my child? Is this thing's not all right for him? Ikhwani, the mother's rights is not something very light. And anyone who does take it lightly, for him awaits him hellfire, the day of judgment. And it's from the major, it is from the, the major sins. The hadith after that, he says, حدثنا سعيد بن أبي مريم قال أخبرنا محمد بن جعفر بن أبي كثير قال أخبرني زيد بن أسلم عن عطاء بن يسار عن ابن عباس This hadith is عطاء بن يسار, he said, he said, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, annahu atahu rajulun a man came to Ibn Abbas. Faqala, he said to him, to Ibn Abbas, I asked a woman to marry me. Meaning, ana khatabtu, inni khatabtu imra'atan. I asked a woman for her hand in marriage. And I wanted to get married to her. She refused me. Fa'abat ad tankihani, she refused to get married to me. Wa khatabaha ghayri, and other than me got married to her. Meaning, another man asked her, and she agreed to marry him and not me. I became jealous, he said. She, she wanted him once he asked her for hand in marriage. He said, I got jealous and I killed her. And this is something that the Arabs were like. Women was something very serious for them. Reputation, their rights, their women wasn't a joke. So here he's saying, 
My jealousy overcame me that I killed this woman. And does the woman have a right to say no to a man? She doesn't want to get married to him? Naam, it's her rights. It's just not allowed that a woman who is speaking to a brother that another brother interferes while she is, while she's speaking to. One of you should not ask the marriage of a sister that a brother is speaking to her. So once you find out a sister and her information is passed to you, ask the first, one of the first questions you ask her is, Sister, are you currently talking to anyone? If she says yes to you, don't say, will I get a chance to get married to you? You say to her sister, I leave you to that brother. If it doesn't ever work out, then inshallah, you can tell your wali to let me know. But whoever is in charge of you, it is not permissible for you. In any way or... The same applies when trading a business. If a person is selling a product and you see that he is... You're not allowed to interfere whilst the product is being sold to this man. You can't say, I'll give it less than... I'll give it better, more money than he's giving you. What will happen? It will place between the hearts of the believers enmity and hate towards one another. And Islam... Looks at the goals, not just the, the means. It looks at the goals. What's been happened now, what will it lead to? So here, brothers, this woman said, I don't want to be married with you. I don't want to be married to you anymore. I don't want you to marry me at all. So he said, I became jealous and I killed her. So here he's asking who? The Sahabi Jalil. Another benefit we extract from the hadith, which is, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. Don't give yourself a... A fatwa, don't give yourself a ruling. If a matter comes to you, go to those who are in knowledge, those who know. Ask them and say to them, what do you think of this matter? I mean, what is the ruling of this matter, sorry? And what has the Quran and the Sunnah said about this matter? A lot of the people, subhanAllah, they are muftis for their own selves. That's the least, at least, if it's not even for other people. So the issue is, that you bring it back to the people of knowledge. If they were only to bring it to the people of authority, meaning the people of knowledge, they would have seen a better consequences or a better outcome. So here, who was the, who was the scholars at that time? Sahaba. The most knowledgeable us of? So Abdullah ibn Abbas, he brought the matter to him. This man brought it to Abdullah ibn Abbas. Brothers, do we need to know who this man was? I mean, do we need to know who this individual was that came to Ibn Abbas? We don't need it. And there's two benefits in that. <coughs> Which is, the ruling doesn't regard an individual. We don't need to know it because it's going to generalize everyone else. It's not got anything to do with our chain of narration, does it? No, it's not. The ch chain has authentically reached Ibn Abbas. We don't need to know who this individual is. So the ibham of this man, meaning this man being hidden from us, and being anonymous, we don't know who it is. It is not going to harm the authenticity of the hadith. The second thing, brothers, you have to know is, there's also another benefit which you can see from it is that the sin is hidden. And the information is, some, is, is brought to the table, so the people can benefit from it, but their name isn't mentioned. And the reason why is because al-mujahara, bil maasi that the person doesn't expose, he does not go out to talk about what? He doesn't talk about his own sins. He does not go out. And sadly enough, subhanAllah, nowadays, the intent might have been good at the beginning, but it's now becoming matters that um, people are... So, for example, sometimes you hear people talk about how they took Islam and everything. Alhamdulillah, the fact that they tell the people, I left kufr, it is not beneficial. I know, and he sticks to that point, which is, is very good. But when he dwells into his sins and he talks about it in details, it can bring two harms. One is that he will sometimes make and I've heard that many times. I heard it. People who said to me, oh, I want to be like that and then repent to Allah and then tell my story of how things have happened. So it has a reverse an effect. The second thing is, this person has now exposed his sins. The Prophet said, Kullu ummati mu'afa. Everyone in my ummah are forgiven. Illa al-mujahirin. Except those who do mujahara, who speak about their sins, what? In the open. So, it's a thin line. By mentioning the evils of kufr and speaking about it and telling them I was once a disbeliever and I, Allah, guided me to Islam and my message to each and every one of you is what? 
Islam is the true religion. And then he goes into the matters of Christianity and Kufr and whatnot. And also sins. He talks about it as a general topic. But he doesn't relay everything to himself. Now, I'm talking. There's two answers for that. First of all, Umar was asked, why are you laughing for? It wasn't a matter he exposed and sat down and told the people about it. They asked him, what made you laugh and what made you cry? Here, even Umar, when he said it, it was a, 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 a way of ijab, amazement and sadness that came to him. That he wanted to share with the people. So it was in a context of him belittling the thing. And I said, as if a person is trying to belittle something. But here nowadays, what is happening is, it's becoming a form of Naam, the thing is being beautified and it's made, it's made to seem to some I'm not generalizing every person I've seen some people who've mentioned their stories and Allah, Alhamdulillah, the haq has come out from them and Alhamdulillah, a lot of people have taken it from them but there's a thin there's a thin line in the matter Naam A lot of times you see that in the hadith, Naam A lot but there's Imam al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, rahimahullah. What he does is these type of narration, he follows up all the narrations, all the chains of narrations, trying to find out who the name of this man is. And, and he wrote a book on it. He, well, he does that. I don't know this particular narration. Nah. That's authentic. Nah. 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 Mm, mm, mm. But there is a dispute as authenticity. Nah. There is. Nah. You were, you... What if it doesn't glorify if he doesn't glorify it and he speaks about it and he exposes it and he tells it, then labas. Because sometimes it has more effect when the person tells you, I being there. It has a more of effect when a person hasn't gone through, through the matter. Now. So here, Ibn Abbas, rahimahullah, he's, when he came to him and he asked him the matter, and he told him, I killed this woman, he said, min tawbah. Ibn Abbas, do I have repentance? Another thing, what do you learn from it, brothers? Don't ever belittle a question that a questioner. Don't ever belittle a question that a questioner puts to you. Because this question uh, is a repentance for me. What does it say in the Quran? Inna Allah yaghfiru. Dhunuba jami'a. Allah forgives all. It's one of the ayats and it's one of the things that a lot of the people know. صح? A man at the time of the companions didn't know this question. So don't ever think to yourself, this person, ah, oh, he's ignorant. Subhanallah, why doesn't he know this issue? He, he lived at the time of who? The companions. And he asked a question like this. Sahih. So sometimes a question that may seem to you dumb, don't belittle the questioner for the question he asks you. Answer the question for him and tell him what it is and what the ruling in that matter is. So he asked him, is there repentance for me? He said to him, Abdullah ibn Abbas looked at him, he said to him, Is your mother alive? Is your mother alive? When he asked him, he said, is your mother alive? قال, لا, no, my mother isn't. He then said to him, Tub ila Allah. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَتَقَرَّبْ إِلَيْهِ مَا اسْتَطَعْتَ And get closer to him. Meaning, get closer to who? Get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And draw, you, and draw yourself near to him. As much as, as, much as you can. فَذَهَبَتْ فذهبت فسألت ابن عباس عطاء بن يسار said I went to ابن عباس the man left عطاء بن يسار came to Abdullah ibn Abbas and he said to him لما سألته why did you ask him about his mother whether she, whether she was alive why did you ask him فقال he said I asked him because فقال إني أعلم I know أما إني لا أعلم sorry I do not know عملا an action so here is it's fascinating in the Arabic language he said, Inni la a'lamu. I do not know. Is la a'lamu, what, what is it in English? I don't. Don't, don't what is it? Negation. A negation. If a negation comes and after it comes an indefinite, it shows generalization. This is a powerful point, principle you have to memorize. If a negation comes and then after that comes after an indefinite word, meaning it's not definite, it is not known, such as what? Inni la a'lamu, I do not know amalan an action. An action here is not known. It's indefinite, right? Because if it was definite, how would we how would we have known that is definite? An alif al lam would have entered it. If an alif al lam enters a noun, does it become definite or indefinite? 
it becomes definite. What about if he doesn't enter it and then a tanween comes at the end? The tanween actually is called an indefinite tanween. So here, amalan is an action. Any actions. Can we apply? We can also apply this on the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. Anyone who negate, anyone who introduces into our religion an action. It's not the action, it's an action. Does it show generalization? What does it mean? All? So it's like kulu bid'atin dalala. It's like every, any, every innovation is what? It's miscarried. So you, you memorize this principle. It's a principle accepted amongst the usuliyin, the people of usul fiqh. Naam, usuliyin. So here when he said to him, I, he's, so what we, what are we benefiting from here? Abdullah ibn Abbas is trying to say, I don't know any action right now for this man at all. Then what? أقرب إلى الله that will get him closer to Allah من بر والدته من بر من بر for him to be obedient to what الوالدته his parents I mean his mother to be obedience to who الله أكبر so he could not see Ibn Abbas this great scholar this عالم this صحابي جليل that the Prophet done a dua for him he is saying I did not know any other actions he can get closer to Allah than being obedient to his towards his mother for the sin that he has done. Here I want to have a quick stop, which is the issue regarding repentance. The repentance, ikhwani, it happens to two, and the rulings regard them change. If the sin was done to a servant, an individual, a human being, then three conditions are needed only. Sorry, four conditions are needed, sorry. If the sin was done to a human, Four, four conditions, four things are needed in order for it to be an accepted repentance. If it's done to Allah, only three is needed. The last one, you drop it. If the sin is done to only Allah, not to a creation, but to the Creator, which is meaning Allah, the repentance, it has three conditions for it to be an accepted repentance. What is the first one? The first one is that the person leaves the sinner. Tarku them, the person leaves the sin. The, the three that I'm going to mention, it's shared with Allah and the person. Both of them. There's a fourth one, it drops for Allah and it's present for the creation. So these three that I mentioned, they both share Allah and the creation. Which is tarku them. If you're doing something wrong to a certain person, when would the repentance be accepted? When you leave off what you're doing to them, sah? And also the same applies with Allah, sah? If you do something wrong by sinning and going against Allah's command, the first thing that is needed from you is what? Abstain, Abstain from it. Leave off the sin. Don't commit the sin. <coughs> okay. The second one is what? al <laughs> azmu The person makes a decision to himself that he won't go back to the sin again. He makes that decision. He says to himself, I will not fall into this sin ever again. Brothers, now you have to remember this and you have to memorize this point. Even if he falls into it a hundred times, it's not a problem. It's if he really makes the, the decision that he won't fall into it. There's a hadith where the Prophet has said, أَذْنَبَ عَبْدِي ذَنْبَا My servant done a sin. فَعَرِفَ أَنَّ لَهُ رَبًّا He recognized that he has a, he's a Lord. He cried back to his Lord. He made the decision that he's not going to do this sin again. I ain't going to do this sin at all, ever again. I promise. He makes that decision. He gets angry with himself. And then later, he falls into the... Will Allah forgive... Was that repentance accepted? It was. The one that's not accepted is... Oh, why did I do it for? I don't know. I'm kind of... Yeah, naam. Half-minded. He's not fully... The azm, the, the decision is not really... At this point, where does it become? Or stuff like stuff, 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 stuff. Nah. Ha. Look, sorry, this. Ha. So all this stuff, 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 Hey, they carry from where they were. That's not an azm. That's not a decision that you've made. The decision is what Allah is going to hold you accountable. Don't worry about the action that you're doing. Right now, what is needed from you is what. And leaving after. The third one is what. A nadam. Nadam means regret. Whenever you remember that sin that you have you done, you've done, it brings you to tears. You just regret it. Regret. <coughs> How on earth could I have done this? 
Why did I do this for? What am I going to do when I go the day of judgment and Allah hasn't forgiven me? The regret that keeps running in your mind, your thought. But the Prophet said, and As though that repentance isn't anything else except what? Except regret. Regret is what? Regret is what? It's a Tawbah. It's one of the peak of Tawbah. And whenever you remember, you regret it. So, if a person is always talking about his sins, is there a regret? Well, I stuck for but you know, when we were jahil, you know? That kind of belief, that isn't repentance. Repentance is when the person doesn't even want to talk about it. Don't say, please, please. I don't even want to remember it. And I show you a side of when you do something to a person, how do you feel when they remind you of what you've done to them? Akhi, you did me that. You regret, Akhi, please don't say, Akhi, please, please, please. Sah. That's the, and more is what you, that, because you really hate it. You, you, you regret what you've done, sah. And you don't like people bringing it up all the time. It has to be like that towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Has to be, or even more, has to be. Those three is for the creation and what? For Allah, the creator. Allah stops there. The fourth one, is the human which is what you give him back the rights that he had on you whatever you've done to him you free for yourself from the rights that he has so for example you robbed money from him you left off the sin you regretted the sin and you also made a decision you'll never do it that's not enough is that enough I can't just say I, just, I came with three conditions. What's needed for me? La, you have to give him back the rights that you've taken from him. You have to what? Give him back the rights. And say, here's your rights that you have on. That you have on me. If the person said something about an individual. He said something about them. And he knows if he goes and tells that person it's going to destroy their relationship. And he's left the sin. And he regrets it. And he's made a decision and he's left off the sin. He comes with the three. But he knows if he goes and tells him and says, Bro, I said this about you, Akhi. I acted like this behind your back. Please forgive me. That's it. They will never talk again. At this time, it is permissible for him to hide it from him. But the still responsibility that's on him is what? Every place where he mentioned evil about him, he has to... Say, bro, brothers... When I said last time about this brother, Wallahi, he was wrong. I was lying. Forgive me, brothers. Wallahi, he's a brother of khair. And you, you change it with? With good. Here, brothers, we also learn. What about if a person is killed? Because the hadith talks about death, right? A killing. There's three rights on the killing. Three rights on the killing. The blood, basically. Three rights are on it. A right of the one that was killed. And the rights of the people of the blood. I mean, what's it called? The blood money. The, the, the people, the people. Meaning the people who request for your killing. I mean, his brothers, his uncles, his father, his, the ones who after he died, they're the ones that choose whether they want you to be killed or extend they just want money from you. And the third, which is what? Allah's right. What about the rights of the Allah? How is Allah's rights going to be uplifted from you? The three conditions that I mentioned. Tarku dhambi. Wal azmu. That you made the decision you're not going to go to sin again. Wal nadam. And you regret it. Those three. That is Allah, right? Allah is the one who will leave you like that when you come with those three conditions correctly. Allah's conditions. This becomes what? Tawbah? Nasuha. A repentance that is accepted. A good repentance. What about the rights of the people? Who is family? What about the family, his family that are behind him, who are now going to request for their rights? Their rights, it revolves around two. If you killed him deliberately, what's their right? That you get? Once you get killed, does your right drop from them? That's it. They can't, the family cannot say anything to you. They've taken their rights from you. They've killed you. Are you with me? Whose rights is left? The one that was killed. al maqtul the one that was killed, his right stays. Killed? 
Mm -hmm. The second one is the right family. The first one is the person who's killed. Yeah. The f second one is the person who's killed. The second one is the family of the person who's killed. Okay. His family yeah. who are after him. Because they lose a child that they've raised for, a mother that raised her child for that long, a father that raised his child for that long. Yeah. They were waiting to get money, his life and everything. They were depending on him. Somebody just kills him. You see? He's from a tribe. They tribe. They... Third one is Allah's rights. As Allah's rights, we talked about it. Any sins that is done to the creation is also done to who? Any sin that is done to a human is, or creation is done to who? That sin is done to? Allah. Because Allah told you not to fall into this sin and not to do it. So the three conditions are always there for Allah and it's also there for... As for the people, what's their rights? The people who killed you. The people who's his family, they've got two choices. If you've killed him deliberately, they've got two choices. They either kill you, which is qisas. They, they ask for your death. Or the second, which is your diya. Meaning they ask for money. Yeah? If it's accident, they don't have no other choice, just money. Or they can forgive you. They can't kill you if it's by accident. But the accident is determined. Are you with me? He, he's, he doesn't want to kill him. He doesn't. Uh, the killing is three types, brothers. It's amdan deliberately. Shibhu amdan. It is a middle one, which is, it looks like it's. And inshallah, in fiqh, they do Bible janayat. When they talk about it, they talk about it very well. I don't want to go into details in fiqh. The third one is khata'an. He done it by accident. He comes out the room, he. Boo! And the brother just dies. <laughs> That's it. Was that deliberately? A, but a, 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 chai, a person. Didn't want to kill this person. He didn't really want to kill him. But he beat him up with a sword. Side on the side. And the sword went in sideways. Ha. Here we're going to say, what did he kill him with? What did he hit him with? Something that? He killed. So here, this is the, this is the issue that the Usul Fuqaha and all of them talk about. Brothers, when a person does a sin, a wrong, what is good to do after that? In al hasanati yudhibna sayyat. The righteous actions, what do they do? They expiate for you. They wipe off the sins. Ibn Abbas now thought of the best righteous action, which is what? Birrul walidain, to be obedient towards.